on this Palm Sunday, we raise our hands and we lift our voices to our King. Before his resurrection, Jesus entered Jerusalem on the colt of a donkey, fulfilling prophecy. And the people laid their cloaks and palm branches in the road before him, and they welcomed him as their king, and they shouted and they cried out, Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, save us.
We thank you, Lord, for sending Jesus that we can be free to come before you. We praise you today for you are a good, good father. stories of what they think you're like but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night and you call me deeper still never alone you're a good Good Father, it's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you, it's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. I've seen many.
they hailed him as king and they cried Hosanna as he entered the city. In less than a week, their cries turned to crucify him. But Jesus did not back off of his mission and he pursued the plan and he went all the way to the cross and he gave his life in place of everyone. Hope we serve a God who loves us so much. There is nothing that we could do to make him love us any more, and there's nothing that we can do to make him love us any less. And the gift of Jesus is just that, a gift. And in communion, we remember and we reflect in our own hearts as a family and as individual children of God. If you did not receive communion on your way in, just go ahead and raise your hand, and an usher will bring you everything you need. We reflect and we remember on the greatest display of love this world has ever seen. We celebrate by taking a cracker to represent the body that Jesus gave and juice to represent his blood that was poured out so that we can be made clean and come before a holy God and we will spend eternity with him in heaven. You are free to take communion at any time during this next song, however God shaped you for worship. You may sit, stand, sing, cry, laugh, kneel, whatever God puts on your heart as a unique child of God. As we remember and we reflect together, our brother and our friend, our savior and our king, Jesus.
domestic problems you might be experiencing. Would it make you feel any better if you knew that what we're asking Matt here to do is a holy thing? You see, we're on a mission from God. First you trade the Cadillac for a microphone. Then you lie to me about the band. Now you're gonna put me right back in the joint. They're not gonna catch us. We're on a mission from God. In six miles to Chicago. We got a full tank of gas, half a pack of cigarettes, it's dark, and we're wearing sunglasses. Hit it. Hey, Hope Church, you glad to be here today? It's so good. It's really good to see you, literally. And thank you for being here today, both in person and online, one church. You know, when you're about the mission, we're on a mission from God, uh, you love to see the church grow in any way it can. Of course, we love seeing new people come to the Lord, but we also love babies, amen? Amen. And we've got uh, James Monroe in the house, and I'm going to ask James to come on up and bring his family. I call him King James, uh, but they they may call him Prince James. You're going to see how incredible he is. He was here last uh, Sunday, and uh, I saw some great pictures. Oh my goodness. Come on, you guys, I'm sorry, just, yeah, come on up the stairs, that'll be easier. Right over here in the middle. Come on over here to the middle, and uh, this is mom and dad, and the godparents, their names are, 
Pa Patty and Ian, where are you from? Oh, wonderful. It's so nice to have you here. Um, we, we don't baptize babies at Hope. Um, we don't believe babies are born guilty of sin. We have a sinful nature we're born with, but we're not guilty of someone else's. And when we grow up and begin to, to understand and know what sin is and everything, we're accountable. One time some uh, disciples were trying to get kids away from Jesus because parents were bringing their kids to Jesus. And Jesus said, let the little children come to me, for such is the kingdom of God. And you must come, become like little children if you are going to inherit the kingdom of God. So he said, we need to become like babies. So we believe they're, they're born innocent, and, um, and then when they understand what repent means and believe later on and can make a commitment to follow, then they're baptized. Yet, but uh, we do have a good tradition of dedicating babies. I, you've heard the phrase, it takes a village. I think it takes a church. I think it's God's plan. If you've ever been a parent in church, you know how you get support and people uh, help you with your kids and help you in parenting. And God's plan for the church is to have that available. And uh, so we want to do a prayer of dedication. I have a Bible for James. Look at that. And uh, I apologize, it's not King James. It's a contemporary version. We bought a few. My wife got them online, and there was a couple uh, box that said uh, King James. Like, all right, that's what I want. Well, they were pink, and I'm not giving him a pink one. <laughs> Nothing wrong with pink. I know Ray. Ray likes pink, but I'm going to give him the, the, this one. But uh, it just says it's from his Hope family with love, and I'll give that to you, Mom. And then if you'll let me, can I hold him for the prayer? This is how I get my baby fixed. What a handsome guy. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for this miracle that I'm holding in my hands. Design demands a designer. And we know this precious baby is a gift from you. And we pray for mom and dad, for Anthony and Siobhan. We pray for them to have wisdom and patience and insight, to seek first the kingdom and know that you will provide for their needs as well. We pray for all of his teachers and all the influences in his life to encourage him the right way, to go the right way. We pray for us as a church. We commit to encourage James in his growth. And we pray that he will be a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ, that he will grow up to be a strong warrior in your kingdom, that you will work powerfully through him to bring you glory and impact others for good. And we believe in that and we dedicate him to you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thanks, guys. He's so cute. Adorable. Amen. Love you guys. Amen. Am I okay right here, Howie? All right. Awesome. What a beautiful baby boy. It's going to be fun to watch him grow up strong in the Lord. Well, we're on a mission from God, and we're on part two, My Story Matters. And uh, I just want to say uh, it's so good to be here. I told the morning crew, that our, our, that our team, leadership team, that some of my friend, pastor friends have taken sabbaticals through the years, and uh, they'll write a book or they'll go to Ireland or somewhere. I have a friend that did that, and uh, uh, I had my first sabbatical in 40-something years um, when my eyes strokes happened. First, I had one in my right, and it's now mostly cleared up, and then I had one in my left. It's probably 90% blocked now. I can't really see out of it, a uh, little window up here, uh, but... Uh, I'm so thankful I could see, but I was so thankful the team here and uh, Dasu and, and Gina said, we got this, and uh, they let me spend time. I've been spending time. I now have a, a pulmonologist and an ophthalmologist and a cardiologist <laughs> and a hematologist, and I didn't even know what those were a few weeks ago, but they're all great specialists, and my wife uh, made it possible to help me have a great team around me, and uh, it's been so nice to focus on those things and then celebrate with you online, watching online. Uh, I did want to share something with you that my son sent me that's kind of cool. Uh, Howie, you'll like, Howie, you'll like this. Our 
Are you like that? <laughs> now, those of you who can't tell, there's an SF there, and if you're, you haven't grown in your spiritual life yet to become a 49er fan yet, uh, you can see it as my initials, okay? Uh, but we now uh, not only have a passionate Portuguese pastor, but we have a passionate Portuguese one-eyed pirate pastor. Aye. <laughs> So uh, it's good to be home. Last week, didn't Gina do an awesome job in our teaching? Man, awesome job. And I uh, encourage you, if you didn't see last week, to, to watch that. You can go to hopechurchparadise.com or our Facebook page, and you can uh, watch the first two major parts of this series, of this uh, purpose. Um, she dealt with how uh, Jesus came on a mission to redeem us, to rescue us, and looked at the gospel and what the gospel is and gave you a great tool. I think there's one in your bulletin again about how to, how to have peace with God and, and that, that God involves us in his mission. He doesn't just come to save us and we believe. We, we become a part of that mission and we share the good news about Jesus, but we also have our own individual unique life uh, story and life testimony and life message and you need to learn to tell your story and I need to tell my story there's people your story can touch that I can't touch I like Acts 26 is a great outline to do to tell your story what life was like before Paul talks about how he was a persecutor how you became to Christ Paul talks about how Jesus appeared to him and then how God has helped you since you become a believer uh, and uh, Paul says, I, I, I know that God has been with me all along since then. So it's before Christ, how I came to Christ, how God has helped you. I do it in short versions. I do it in long versions. I tell my story over and over. Someone says, well, I've tried religion. I'm not into religion. I say, oh, you know, I used to think the same thing. that It was about religion. Then I learned it's about a relationship. And that I could have a relationship with the creator of the universe. That's awesome. I just told a little tidbit of my story in my own journey. And I have longer versions. Recently, I had someone ask me, I think it was Anthony or somebody, he got more than he probably wanted to hear, but I told my whole story at our whole ministry. And tell your story. Everybody has a story. And so today, we're moving into fishing in our, our mission pond, and then uh, how to become a on-mission disciple of Jesus. And uh, that'll be part two of My Story Matters. So fishing, uh, following and fishing go together. Following Jesus and fishing go together. If we're not fishing, we're not following. Jesus said to the first disciples, you can read it in the Gospels, he said, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. First of all, he says, come follow. Follow means it's more than intellectual acknowledgement of some beliefs and I live however I want. The way of the disciple of Jesus is a lifestyle. And, and in case someone might say, well, he's talking to the apostles. They had a special mission, so they are going to be the fishers of men. Well, John wrote in 1 John 2, 6, whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus walked. And as we saw last week, five times in the Gospels and in the book of Acts, Jesus gave that commission, the great commissions, to go and make disciples of all. So all of us are called not only to follow, but to fish. He says, come follow me. We follow a person, not a, group, you know, a bunch of laws. We follow Jesus. God said, here's how I want you to live and follow and, and keep your eyes on Jesus. Come follow me and I will make you. I tell people when I study with them about becoming a Christian, it's almost kind of spooky a little bit here. But when you become a follower, you have to be willing to be changed. I will make you doesn't mean I will force you because God is a God of choice, free choice. Amen? But he wants us to want him. And if we allow him, it's really, I will make you means transformation. He will transform us. He will change us. And that happens all of our lives in the, the process. Sanctification is the Bible word, the Christianese word. But it's constantly uh, growing in, into the image of Christ. He says, come, follow me, and I will make you into fishers of men, of people, of human beings. You've been fishing for fish, he says to these fishermen, and I'm going to make you fishers of people. And there's, if you're not fishing, you're not following. If I'm not fishing, 
I'm not following. He will make us, he will equip us, he will train us. As we keep our eyes on him, we become fishers of men. And following and fishing go together. Now, introducing people to Christ is like fishing, not hunting. It's like fishing, not hunting. I'm not a hunter. I know some of you are, some of my closest friends Randy's a great shot, you know, and Joe, a lot, a lot of my closest friends are great hunters, and I don't talk much about it to them, because I don't want them to think I'm a wimp, but I don't really like it. it it's so noisy, you know, and uh, I lost a friend when I was a kid who died in a hunting accident. I never told anybody about that. It was one of the first times I saw someone dead, was one of the kids my age, uh, and uh, then my dad quit hunting when he loved to hunt, and he, he got ill and couldn't do, go anymore, so I never went with him, so I just never got in it. I got into football people. I like to run into people. That was my ha- hobby, but uh, uh, I never got into hunting. But a lot of evangelism training, they train it kind of like you're a hunter, you know, kind of like you're trying to get these scalps. Ha, I got another one, you know, and uh, it's really more like fishing than it is like hunting. See, hunting, you, you go, go, go and look, and you, you, you go anywhere you can and you find it and then you shoot it and and blow it away and then you go and you got to cut it up and pull the guts out and you got to bleed it and you, a lot of times you go so far you got to carry it a long ways i can drive a few minutes to costco and walk out with a ribeye you know so it's just not my thing but i i think it's cool a lot of people are into men and women that are into hunting uh, but fishing is more like what our evangelism is, and Jesus calls it fishermen. Evangelism means a good news sharer. It, it doesn't mean a salesman. Some people say, well, I'm not really a salesperson. They think of evangelism, they have to try to talk somebody into it. Really, it's more like being a matchmaker. You're trying to help people fall in love with Jesus. Jesus already loves them, and our hope is, and his hope is that they will fall in love with him. And so we're more like that. And fishing and hunting are different. Hunting is aggressive, but fishing's a little more gentle sport. Hunting is based on confrontation. Fishing is based on attraction. You attract them with bait. If you, you walk on a pier where people are fishing, you'll hear someone say, you having any luck? And And they'll say, what are you using? Because they know bait's so important. And hunting, you go and you shoot them. And a lot of evangelism is like that. But uh, fish, I mean, the training is like that. But truthful, it's more like fishing where you, you get them to nibble on the bait. In hunting, you use a one bullet that will fit what you're trying to kill, that one bullet, and you shoot them. Fishing allows you to use different lures and hooks and baits and things like that. In hunting, you take your best shot and it's over. You take aim and bam! And it it scares the animal off if you miss. In fishing, you're reeling the fish in and it requires a little give and take. And you get more than one chance. Sometimes a fish will nibble and kind of go away and it'll come back and nibble some more. In hunting, the animal has no choice. In fishing, the fish gets a choice. He could take the bait or not. Also, in hunting, you have to be skilled shot. You don't want to just hand somebody a gun and they go, I had to get a little training when I had a pistol uh, to kill rattlesnakes in my house down by the airport, you know, and it was a lot better with a gun than doing the shovel dance, you know, but uh, I had to learn about that. You can't put your finger on the trigger when you're walking around, right, guys? So there's things you got to learn uh, or you can get in trouble. Anybody can drop a line. Now, I'm, I know they're skilled fishermen, like Donald's one of those ones that always catches fish, you know, but, but anybody can. I've caught two huge fish. Uh, one guy took me on the Columbia River where he, he put down an anchor. We sat there all day, strong current, and I, uh, we're getting ready to leave. And I go, I think I got something. He goes, no way. I go, yeah. And I caught a sturgeon. And we, I reeled that in. He's got a hold of me, and he's just laughing so excited that I caught a fish. It was the biggest fish I ever caught and ever saw. And he goes, oh, we got to put it back. I go, what? That's the biggest? Because they got to be like 44 inches on the Columbia before you know, take the sturgeon, these prehistoric looking things. They taste great, though. He brought me some that he caught. Uh, and uh, I also caught on, my, on the Brooklyn Bay. My son-in-law, Jeff, bought us all a trip out on the Brooklyn Bay for Willie, my other son-in-law's bachelor party. And three of us caught 50-pound stripers out there. 
man, it tastes like lobster. Now, two huge fish stories, and I don't know how to tie a hook on the string. My friends do that for me. I don't know how to do the weights. One time we lived in Pacifica, my first ministry, and it was in San Francisco, and I took Allie down to the beach, because I, I always saw my dad surf fish, and I said, I'm going to try that, and I had a pole, and I put some weights on it, I didn't know what, how many or what to do, and I tried to cast it, and I broke the line. And the line went flying, and I was worried someone would get hooked. So I ran out there, and I was trying to get it. And my little girl, Allie, with curly hair, was running by me. Did you catch one, Dad? Did you catch one? She didn't know I wasn't much of a fisherman. In Jesus' day, nets were used for fishing, not rods and reels. Today, there's more methods to fish than they had in Jesus' day. There's bass boats with sonar, all kinds of gizmos and gadgets, I better stop talking about this. Donald's going to sneak out the back door. You can't go fishing right now, Donald. Uh, but um, you, you and I, we need to identify our personal fishing pond. We need to figure out who are the fish personally in our lives. When Jesus spoke to the apostles before he ascended to heaven, he said, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the ends of the world, to, the, to every part of the world, one translation says in Acts 1.8. Notice he says witnesses. You're not his attorney. You don't have to persuade, persuade, persuade. Your wit a witness just shares what they've experienced. You know, like the blind man said, all I know is I was blind and now I can see. I like that verse now. God, God changed his life. So he could give a testimony. He could witness about how God had changed his life. That's what we're, we're called to do to, to, spread, to spread how God has saved our life. In Jerusalem, he said, your Jerusalem is where you live. They lived in Jerusalem. It was their city. It was their town. That's where they're to start. You start in your sphere of influence, in the relationships that you and I have. That's our Jerusalem, our network, our family, you know, our friends, our coworkers the people closest to us. And then he says, then to Judea. Judea is like going to another county, you know, to people that you can reach out to in Yuba or, you know, in, in other, other towns and other counties close to you, people like you, but they're a little farther away. Then Samaritans, he says to Samaritans. The Samaritans were ethically and, and uh, culturally different than the Jews. And so he says, I want you to go to people who have a different culture than you. Maybe they have a different language and background. Do you know anybody that has a different language and a different culture? If you live in California, you do. If you ever go get fast food, you probably do, you know. Because sometimes the people taking the order have a really strong accent, and you're trying to listen. So I'm not making fun of them. In fact, I respect bilingual people and people who learn different languages. But you don't have to go very far in California to hear different languages, to find different cultures. The world has come to us. And, and one, the most international city may be Los Angeles. People, there's it's so many languages. It's incredible. And then online, we have so many uh, people that we can reach that are different than us. And he says, to the ends of the world. We all have a Jerusalem, and we have a Judea, and we have a, a, Samaria, a Samaria. And it's never been easier to go to every part of the world. So you start with you, your inner circle, yourself, and confess Jesus as Lord and cross the line and become a member of his family, his forever family. And then uh, you look at people closest to you, your family, your best friends, your relatives. Circle goes a little farther out, your neighbor, your neighborhood. Last night, my wife and I went on a pedal progressive dinner in our neighborhood and rode with people on bikes in the high winds uh, to four different houses, and I, that was my, now, my new Jerusalem. It was fun riding with one eye in the wind. And anyway, that's part of our neighborhood is our, our, is our, our Jerusalem, and it's people close to us. And, and those who you work with, you see people at work, your business associates, uh, you see them all the time. And then there's 
acquaintances that we come in contact with that if we're ready, that God brings into our life. And if uh, sometimes I, I, I'm, I'm so focused on my to-do list, I don't realize right in front of me is an opportunity, a waitress or a waiter or someone that I can share a good word with. At Hope, we've seen growth among friends and among family. I just love that we have families that members that have come, just like in Jesus' day, uh, they had families, they had brothers, they, John the Baptist was his cousin. We've had people come to Hope Church that are part of our, our families and our friendships. We, had, we stood together and said, let us rise up and build in 2010. And pe- people like Tom Turkenen were inviting the whole car club and, and others were inviting their family members and, and, and Grammy came and then her whole tribe came and uh, there's just so many stories of people. I'm sorry to mention a couple of names and I can't mention everybody. Men's Ministry is helping the mission in Chico. That's, that's Judea. That's our Judea. And those guys are from different parts of the country that are in the mission. And um, a friend from New York that I grew up with called and said, I have a sister in a bad way health-wise and needs some help in her home uh, that needs painted and cleaned up. In Sacramento, do you know anybody that could go paint it? I said, yeah, me. And so four of us went down and we did a little mission trip and uh, that's a little bit more like Samaria, maybe. <laughs> but uh, we, we went there, and here was a little kid that was uh, sleeping in a, in a little garage that had been converted to a bedroom that really needed some work. And it just touched our hearts, because that's what happens when you do the mission. It works on you, not just others. And then we got in a circle, we were done, and they were so thankful. And the young mom was there, and we, we said, that we, they're thanking us. We go, oh, no, this is because of Jesus that we did this. And we prayed with them. And we started supporting the Rwanda missionaries that for a while, before we were self-supported, we helped them because we didn't believe it's just here and then we grow and then someday there. Jesus said both. He never taught, take care of your own town, but don't worry about others. He said both. You're Jerusalem, you're Judea, you're Samaria to the end of the earth. So we helped those missionaries till they came home. And we helped Seeds of Hope, which was helping young girls and boys get out of prostitution in Costa Rica because their family sends them out to do that to make money for their family. Their own parents do that. And they started these clubhouses where they bring them in, they teach them uh, about Jesus, and they also teach them about taking care of their health and about ways to make money like jewelry and different things with their skills rather than selling their bodies. And that model has multiplied not only in Costa Rica, but other Spanish-speaking uh, countries. And we're a part of that. We, it, we, it, the best we could, we didn't spend a whole lot, but we're still a part of that mission because it's not just here and later there, it's both. And we have helped with children's hospitals. We still are. One time I got a call when we started Rock the Ridge from Gridley and they said, could you come down here and help us do a Rock the Ridge and bring your gear? So we drove down there and took the trailer and all the gear and park in the middle of Gridley. Only they, instead of Rock the Ridge, they called it uh, Rally the Valley. And uh, we helped them. Why? Because it's part of our Judea. And so that's part of the mission. Susan George Price is a part of our online church every week. She's a faithful participant. Then she shares our messages, and she shares our lifters online. She's doing the mission. Bien Chin is a friend of mine I met in San Francisco in Silicon Valley from China. Now he's in Hawaii. He's a part, a regular part of our online church, and he's doing ministry where he's at. Jesus told one guy, go home and tell your friends and family what God has done for you. If you look at the first disciples, Andrew We don't know a whole lot about Andrew, but Andrew reached his brother, Peter. We know a little bit about Peter, right? And um, you have brothers coming together. Like I said, I mentioned John the Baptist, pointing people to his cousin, Jesus. You have Matthew, also known as Levi, the tax collector, becomes a follower. First thing he does, he throws a big party for tax collectors, his associates that he worked with. And so you have that in the ministry of Jesus. How many of you came to hope because somebody invited you? Yeah, most, most of us came because we were invited. Forrest Orndorff invited me. 
He said, I want you not to, we don't want to interview you. We want you to consider to become part of our family. And I said, wow, I like that. I wanted to be a part of that. And so who have we invited recently? I put an invitation in your bulletin. I just put one in there. And there are plenty more on the back table if you want to take more, if you promise to hand them out. But I'm just trying to give you a little tool to help you. You can carry in your car or whatever. It says, you are invited to my church. I want you to own it. It's your church. It's as much your church as it is my church. Some people say, oh, it's Jesus' church. You can't say it's my church. Well, this, this little finger would say, this is my body. I belong to this body. You know, if you're a member of his church, it's your church. And so you, I want to invite you to my church. Come as you are, encouraging music and messages that relate to everyday life. And it's, it's got the address. So I wanted to put something in your hands to help you, a, a little tool. And we want to keep thinking of ways to spread the message. I've been slow to push evangelistically the last couple of years, slower than I ever have my whole ministry. I mean, I was flame on fire when I first started the ministry because God saved my soul and some missionaries, my teachers, taught me about the mission. But with the COVID going on, I really wanted to respect your decision. And I didn't want to be that guy, that pastor that got a bunch of people sick. And so I, bless you. So I, uh, sorry. So I couldn't help myself. So, uh, Oh, you know, I just backed off a little bit on asking you to invite. We went kind of like that. And, uh, but I feel like now it's time to push. Now it's time to push. And it's time to invite people here. It's time to invite people on Easter. It's time to invite people to our small groups. It's time to plan a rock the ridge. And it's time to pack the house. And I'm excited about the time. I've been, I've been thinking about this, and I'm so excited to see God do it again. The starting point, step one, is you identify your fishing pond. And then this next verse from 1 Corinthians, the ideal of it is, I didn't put this on your outline or PowerPoint, but is you study the fish in your pond. You, you learn what, pe what the people in your pond are like. I, I believe that's one of the reasons that Donald's a great fisherman. They're, they're crazy. The guys are really into it. They'll call through mud, go anywhere, everywhere they can to get a fish. They learn all about the fish. And so we've got to study those people in our lives. 1 Corinthians 9.22 on your outline says, I have become all things to all people so that I can save some uh, in, in any way possible. When you look at the context that that statement is sandwiched in, in 1 Corinthians 9, Paul says to the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those without the law, I became like those without the law. And to those who are weak, I became like the weak so I could win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that I could save some of them in any way possible. I do this because of all the good news so I can share in its blessing. If you've ever shared the gospel with someone who became a believer, you know what he means. When you become all things to all people to bring them to Jesus and then they come to the Lord, you share in the blessing of the gospel. Is he saying he changed the message? Absolutely not. He wrote most of the New Testament. He, he was sold out bonsai to the gospel of God's grace. But he's saying that he tried to find things in common with people to communicate people. And frankly, a lot of religious people do not want to do that. They do not want to change. They want everybody to become like them. And they sit inside their walls. I can't believe these these sinners out there, Jesus never cleaned the fish before he caught them. Jesus called everybody to come as they are. And too many uh, preachers, they don't want to change. We're looking back all the time on how we used to do it. They just do it like we used to do it. Fish aren't interested on in how you used to fish. Fish uh, are, are the ones who you got to try to learn about to catch. This verse changed my life. It changed my career, my calling. It changed where I lived a few times because I wanted to do whatever it takes to win as many as possible, and I have no regrets. It's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Mission is reaching people where they are, not expecting them to become like you, and then you'll accept them. Jesus uh, called people all kinds of people, and then he, the Spirit works in our life and we grow. Let me ask some fishermen or fishing women here. 
Do you catch fish on your terms or their terms? Their terms. You know, get on here, fish. I know you want this. Get on this hook. No, you're trying to catch it on their terms. So the point is, the more we know about a person, the easier it is to reach them. That's why you start with those who are closest to you. You have things in common and interests, and you know about needs and hurts. And the Bible says Jesus knew what people were thinking. No wonder he was so good at reaching people. He understood their needs, and he understood their interests, and he understood their hurts. If we're going to reach people, we've got to think about their needs and their hurts and their interests because that's when they become receptive. When I, bec- when I came to paradise, I became a student of the ridge. And the people who taught me about the people of the ridge are sitting in this room. That's how I would ask Gene, well, what's it like growing up here? And, what's, and I would think about the people on the ridge as we planned events like Rock the Ridge and Crazy Luau's and did some things uh, uh, to order to attract people on the ridge. And I fell in love with the people on the ridge. And, you know, uh, at the base of our brain, on the brain stem, there's this thing called a ROS, R-A-S, a reticular activating system. You can find any book on neurology, and it talks about this thing that we all have. It's a filter that God put in our brain so that we don't consciously respond to every stimuli that happens. For example, if we have the air conditioning on, you might not hear it. Unless you focus on it, then you can hear it. And you may not hear someone cough unless you really try to focus on it. The moment you focus on it, you hear it. But we cut out so much. Why? Because uh, it doesn't get through our filter, our ROS. If we responded to every stimuli, every sound, every smell, every taste, every the feeling, everything that we see constantly bombarding us, it would make us crazy. Now, some of the people in my life, their filter lets in a little more than I, I, mine does. <laughs> they see a little more details. I'm married to someone like that. I work with someone like that. But we all have the ability to shut some things out. Why am I saying all this? Well, the, there's three things that get our attention. One things we value. You ever think like, I need a refrigerator. And you get interested and you value a fr- And all of a sudden you see refrigerators all the time, right? They were already there before, but you weren't thinking about it. You weren't valuing them. Uh, the second thing, that th- things that threaten us get our attention. A rattlesnake gets my attention. I, 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 that doesn't, the filter doesn't stop that baby when I hear that rattle. Number three, things that are unique or different can get our attention. Because they're intriguing, they're interesting. Oh, I hadn't heard that. That's, that's interesting. Now, those last two, I don't believe, are the best ways to evangelize. Fear, although some use it, scare people out of hell, scare the hell out of them, scare them into heaven. I think the, the greater motive, value, is love and God's love. That's why we sing about God's love all the time, because deep down, everybody wants to be loved. First time a guy said, I love you, at a devotional when I went to Bible school, Big guy from Montana. I'm from the oil fields of Tap. Say, like, whoa, wait, wait, wait a minute, dude. I wasn't used to that. And I walked out in the parking lot. I still remember it. I went, wow, that felt good. I'm going to start telling people that. Because deep down, we all want to be loved. Not scared to death, uh, but loved. And so the value is the one that I think is the good way to bring people to Jesus. And so we, when I plan a series, I, I talk about anxiety because people need peace and people need contentment and i try to do i'm starting one that may not sound the best just when you first hear it humility on easter four weeks on humility but i wanted to do it because i want to show the principle it's a huge important principle it's the law of uh, god brings down the pride the proud but he exalts the humble I've seen it again and again. I've seen it in my own life. I get prideful and I get smacked in the face. I hit a wall, relational struggles. I humble myself and God works things out. So that's a need that people have uh, and, and God's way. So we try to think of things that people value to help them come 
to the Lord. Fish get hungry at different times. Some, uh, that's another principle. Some want to eat in the morning, some want to eat in the evening, or some in the middle of the day. And the Bible says, be wise in the way you act towards unbelievers. How open are they to the good news? Sometimes people are very open, and sometimes they're very closed, and it can change. That's the thing to remember. Sometimes you have someone you really love and care about, but they're resistant. They're not open, and it makes you so sad. you got to remember, sometimes people change. I believe my mom's prayers is what brought me back to the church. She would not give up on me. And she wasn't shocked when I came back. And she wasn't shocked when I said I want to go in the ministry. You don't give up on people, but sometimes you got to back off on the approach because they're resistant or they're, they're skeptical, they're negative. You could see it on their face, they don't want to hear it. In the parable of the so- soils, Jesus talks about different kinds of soils and teaches the principles of receptivity. You know, some soil's too shallow, some's distracted, too hard, but there's good soil. When you plant in the good soil, it bears fruit, and God is the one who makes things grow, and our job is to scatter seed and try to find those who are receptive and to, uh, to share with them. There's different stages. There's the, the, res- the, the resistance stage. Like I said, they're critical. You know, they're not into it. But then the receptive stage. They get this awareness that there's this unmet need or this spiritual void in their life like I did. I had a hole in my heart, even though I had a lot of things and good friends. There was something missing in my heart. And and it's a God-shaped hole. When people start getting that, they're becoming receptive and they become in the seeker stage. They want to gain understanding. They visit a church or they visit a, a small group. They're trying to figure some things out and they start kind of realizing, well, God made me. So I guess life does make sense if I live in a relationship with my creator instead of going my own way to do it all on my own. Now that person is starting to be drawn into the believing stage and become a follower of God, and they can come into the family of God, a member, and then they start growing, maturing, looking at Jesus, and then they learn to use their gifts and ability, their shape in ministry, and now they are on a mission from God. Mission is, it's not about me, we learn. It's about reaching other people. I'm here to be the salt. I'm here to be the light. I I climb God's mountain. God's got this incredible mountain. The church is compared to a mountain in Scripture. We stand at the base, and he says, okay, you're not going to climb this on your own strength. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Take me, God. I'm yours. I'm in. And then he begins to take us up the mountain, and we begin to hunger and thirst for things that are right. And he fills us, and we're growing, and we're maturing we start to have mountaintop experience. That's magnification. That's worshiping God. And God says, okay, in this life, we only have so much time. In this life, we don't get to stay on the mountain. I'm going to send you down the mountain, and you are the salt of the world. Oh, I've got to learn to use my shape, my ministry, to serve the body and help out in the community. And now you are the light of the world. And I leave the mountain to go out in the world to bring just one more to the mountain of God. What do I do with friends in in the resistance stage? Pray for them. Pray for them. Build a relationship through love and service. I have certain friends that are not open. I don't bring up church. They already know what I do. I don't bring they gotta they gotta beg me to get to talk to them about it. I'm just gonna keep loving them, keep loving them, show them I'm just a regular guy. And I love the Lord, but I, I want to build a relationship, love them. And then you can invite them to what we call bridge events, like when we have a Rock the Ridge, or when we have a harvest party, or a tailgate. Invite them to fun bridge events. And, uh, and then what not to do, argue. I don't want to win arguments. I want to win souls. And arguments don't work. And when they're receptive, what do you do? You talk, you share your story, uh, 
you share, you, if you see similar circumstances they're dealing with, you can talk to them and how God has helped you in that. I don't know what I would do without my faith as I've been through COVID and through the wildfire and God, you know, because I think about people who don't know God going through that. It must be so difficult and I feel so sorry for them and God has, helps us. And so you share things that you can, that they can relate to and you invite them to church and you invite them to small groups and, and um, what makes people receptive? change, difficulty, divorce. Divorce is a very tough thing, and I'm sorry if you have gone through that or you're going through that, but divorce is also a great opportunity to share the love of God. People change jobs. Uh, people have a baby. They're like, oh, what do I do now? You know, their whole life has changed. Changes like that. People move into your town. You see a U-Haul. Go help them unload. Or order a pizza, you know. That's an opportunity when people are going through changes. And so God's got this global plan for your life and my life to become a world-class Christian. God's plan has always been global. He's always been interested in the entire world. Jesus said, go everywhere in the world and tell the good news to everyone. Did you hear those two words? Everywhere and everyone. When we uh, are only concerned about our own country, our own town, we do not have God's global vision. There's no place off limits. Many people think the job to take the good news to different parts of the world is just the job of missionaries and pastors, you know, the professionals. But it's the job for all of us to go to our Jerusalem, our Judea, our Samaria, and to the ends of the world. Do you think the first disciples were overwhelmed when Jesus said, go into all the world? These re this remote place in the world, they're standing there. Some of them were probably barefooted. And, you know, they had donkeys and they walked everywhere. And he says, I want you to go everywhere in the world. And, and, and now it, it's a small world after all, because now we literally can go into all the world. When I started uh, the ministry, I wrote snail mail letters to my brother who was a missionary in Brazil, these long letters back and forth. That's how we communicate. Now we can text. You know, it's a small world after all. When I started bulletins, I actually did cut and paste. You're thinking, oh, you highlight it and right click. No, cut and paste. And white out was everywhere. I thought I had the coolest logos, you know. And I would go find a copy machine at the dime store. That was my first bulletins in San Francisco. And like no other generation in history, we now have the whole world at our fingertips. We can literally take the message to millions of people in the world from our bedroom. We have tools today that no other generation of Christians ever had. God never withdrew the great commandment and the Great Commission. It's easier now than it's ever been. You can fly to Tokyo faster than you can drive to that other country, Texas. Some, some church leaders sit in lunches. I've heard it. They talk about the people, how they're not receptive, and they're just not committed. And I disagree. They're overcommitted. They're committed to soccer, and they're committed to yoga, and they're committed on and on. The list goes. And we've got to learn how to help them be hungry or the message. Jesus said the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send workers into his harvest. He said, don't blame the harvest. Quit blaming the harvest. We need workers. And so you go to chapter 10, and he's, he sends the disciples out after he had told them. After he had looked at compassion, Matthew 9, he says, pray. Guys, we're going to have a, a prayer time, a prayer chain. Great idea, Jesus. And so we pray and pray for workers. And in Matthew 10, he says, guys, God has answered our, plan, our prayer. Oh, really, Jesus? Who are the workers? And Jesus says, I'm sending you out. Oh, boy. Jesus said, you are the workers. Jesus had a plan for all disciples to become disciplers. It's a mission that's given to every follower. And if we're not fishing, we're not following. I had mentors who taught me this, who'd come home from the mission field from South Africa and from South America. 
and they would cry tears and talk about lost people all over the world. And my brother went on a mission team down in South America. We decided we weren't ready to go foreign, and we felt called to be domestic missionaries, and we went to be with some church planners in San Francisco. And God let me walk around those streets by the Tenderloin, had a little office on Van Ness, and I baptized a pimp, and I baptized some prostitutes, and I baptized some street people, and we grew to 200. And then I went to work with a discipleship ministry that grew from 30 people in Berkeley, came to San Francisco, grew to 1,000. And I saw a lot of good things, but too much control and accountability that was too strong. I went to finish my bachelor's in Oklahoma City, worked with a church. We got, we got to be a part of a team that grew several hundred. Went to Portland. The first Sunday, there was 180, and we grew to 500 by the time in the time that we were there. We started an evangelism seminar. I started getting calls. I started visit. I spoke in almost every state in the U.S., and God took me to speak in Mexico. This kid from the oil fields, he took me to speak in uh, Brazil. He took me to Canada. Tracy and I, they flew us in this little a little tiny plane up to this church plant up in Canada. And uh, he took me to Alaska. And, and all of it was because I stood at the baptistry at the preacher school. We studied about repentance and baptism. I go, you know, I was baptized when I was really young, but I'm not sure about my commitment. I'd like to be baptized. And the, the director of the school goes, well, if you're going to be a pastor, you might want to be baptized. Feel good about your baptism. So but my big brother baptized me, and I stood in there, and I said, Jesus, I want to be like you. I'll go anywhere. I'll give up anything. I'll do whatever you want me to do. And I believe that's why he's taken me so many places to preach the good news, because when you say I'm ready to be on mission, get ready. I went to Silicon Valley. We grew to a couple hundred dot-com bubble burst, and the recession happened, and I was humbled. We had to close that mission. And I came here and fell in love with some people, and I prayed in the cabin I'd lived in the first year. God, bring us workers. The board's open to children's ministry and musicians. God, bring us musicians. And one time, sometimes I would get worried, but God would say to me, I felt like he, through the word and the Holy Spirit, he's saying, you have everything you need to be the, the church, be the body of Christ. And some of you have heard me say, I feel like I'm on my fifth startup with hope since the fire and uh, the pandemic and Omicron and all the stuff we've been through. And I think I'm ready. Here we go. We're getting through Omicron. I have two eye strokes. What? And I'm in the hospital. And I'm sitting there in the hospital. I've been to the hospital a lot on the other side. I haven't spent much time on the bed. And, uh, you know, the gown, that's fun, isn't it? And I'm, I'm looking. I'm like, what's, what's going on? I was ready to get rocking here. And here I am. And uh, on the first Sunday when I'm in the hospital, I put our service on. 10 o'clock, there's lots of activity in my room. They're doing tests on me nonstop and drawing blood and all this. And they're hearing the gospel preach. And they're hearing our band. And I uh, started looking at my, my family. And I saw uh, Ariana singing and Rhett and Donald playing and Kaylin and Ava's testimony and uh, Gina teaching and and then I went home, and two weeks I'm in my chair, and I'm watching it again, and I realize uh, 12 years ago, none of those people I was watching leading us weren't here. Don't feel sorry for yourself. You haven't started over. You got a lot more than you had before. And God has people, I believe, here that, that are not here yet. Amen? Amen? And you don't measure a church's greatness by its seating capacity, you measure it by its sending capacity. And, and everyone who calls upon the Lord shall be, says, shall be saved, it says in Romans 10.13. And I have Romans 10.13 on your outline, and I have Romans 10.15. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But I want you to hear what's in between. How can they call on him who they have not believed? How will they believe if they haven't heard? How will they hear if no one's preaching or teaching to them? How can anyone preach unless they are sent? And then it says, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. I want you to watch this testimony here. 
Good morning, Hope. I am Elizabeth, for those of you that I don't know, and I'm sad that I'm not able to join you in person this morning, but so honored that I was asked to share a little bit about my story and God's mission on my life with you today. So I grew up in church, and I have memories of being really, really little and going to church and Sunday school with my family and those sorts of things. But then we didn't go for quite a few years until I was in about sixth grade when we started attending Hope. Um, and Gina, who is a good friend with my mom, actually had invited us to Hope. Um, and I think she actually invited us a few times before we came, <laughs> but eventually we did. Um, and then we didn't stop coming. And I, our family really grew here and Hope really became home. Um, so I went to Sunday school for a little while and I helped in the nursery for a little bit and got involved in youth group and I was really like dipping my toes in the water of ministry but not really jumping in right away and then about a year after we had been attending Hope I just happened to be at church early one Sunday morning and I was helping with communion um, when somebody asked if I knew how to run PowerPoint which I only kind of knew how to do but I was happy to help with whatever was needed um, and I quickly learned how to run that and then jumped right into the tech team um, and Howard and Rob, who were in that ministry, really took me in and not only showed me how to run tech equipment and how to work on a team, but also what it meant to be an active participant in the family of Christ and to be using the gifts that God had given me. And we did everything from scheduling to crawling in the attic and under the stage. And it was exciting. I was 12 getting to explore ministry with these amazing teachers and mentors and now friends. And I was able to form and deepen a relationship with Jesus that has been so amazing and so wonderful and hope is really a big part of the, like a big reason of what I'm doing now. Um, so I tried for a while to kind of avoid the call that God had put on my life into full-time ministry. I was looking, thinking about things that were more practical and um, I was really lacking fulfillment. So I started looking at my life and what I wanted to do and what I found joy in and this, this true joy that only comes from God. and. I really wanted to be doing ministry all of the time and to be a part of God's mission. So now <laughs> I am studying Christian ministries and biblical studies at Azusa Pacific University in Southern California. I get an opportunity to learn about different forms of ministry and different aspects of leadership and really see all of the amazing ways that God is working in other people and in our world. Um, and then over this last break, I was presented with an opportunity to serve internationally. Um, so currently, I am preparing to go on a mission trip to Santiago de Compostela in Spain over this upcoming summer. We're going to be working with an organization called One Collective. So I'm going on a team of five people and we're getting the opportunity to experience all of the ways that God is working through the skills of local business owners and through farmers and church leaders. We're getting to serve in community kitchens and a community garden, learning to make soap with their apothecary ministry and serve in a grocery store and really participate in their church movement. It will really be about learning to combine work with worship um, while getting to be the hands and feet of Jesus. So I'm really, really excited about this opportunity to go on a mission trip. It's always been a little dream of mine to get to travel to see more of God's creation. And now I get to do that and to be serving part of God's mission, which I think is so amazing. And I would be so honored if you wanted to partner with me in serving this organization in Spain whether that be financially or through prayer. Um, I'm currently working to raise about $1,200 towards the trip. So if you feel God calling you to take part in this mission for his kingdom with me, I would love to partner with you. Um, I have a little QR code that will be put on the screen that you can scan with your cameras that will take you to my fundraising website where you can, there's a button to donate. Um, or you can give a check to Hope that will get to me. And I really just want to thank you in advance for all of your help and all your prayers for this trip and really the impact that you at Hope have had on my life and my mission and God's mission for us. Um, and this is a huge next step for me, and I'm so excited to see what God does with it and would be so blessed to get to share a little bit of God's mission on my life with you this morning um, and get to get to haul Hope home. And so I love you so much and I will see you all soon. So this code is your way to donate and it'll take you to our website. You can take a picture of that or scan it. Also, I think Howard's going to have it up at the end of service so you could do it then. Also, if you decide that scares you, uh, and you want to just do a check, put it in the memo for Elizabeth and, and put it here at Hope, and we'll make sure she gets that. Let's send Elizabeth on her mission trip. Amen? Amen.
See, that's why we're here, to watch people rise up among us and go into all the worlds. Habakkuk uh, 1 says, Look at the nations and watch. Be utterly amazed, for I'm going to do something in your days that you would not believe it if someone told you. There's two billion people who say they're Christians today, but there's still billions that we need to reach out to and pray about. The, the Bible has in more translations than it has ever been. It's a huge amount. Uh, missions agencies are growing. We've seen opportunities with things like a saddle back when they helped us and uh, Samaritan's Purse. Uh, Franklin Graham, who blessed our area. There's people going all around the world. You can serve in those kinds of... I would be in Ukraine right now if I wasn't half blind, and uh, I need to stay here right now. But I have friends there that would take me, that offer to take me. Because it rips my heart to see what's happening in the spirit of those people. And you know who's helping over there that you don't see on the news a lot? The church. The church is bringing people across the line. I know a pastor that helped transport some people last week into Poland. The church is giving women and children food and clothing. The church is helping them find a roof over their house. You don't hear about that, but the church is making an impact around the world. I have some blanks to, to just fly through real quick if you're a note taker. What does it take to be an on-mission person? Number one, shift our thinking from self-centeredness to God-centeredness. It's not about me. It's about God, his mission. Number two, shift thinking from local orientation to global orientation or you're a global Christian. You're here to reach all the world. Number three, shift thinking from temporary values to eternal values. It's not about getting a bunch of stuff and put it in a can and sit on the can. You know, he who dies with the most toys still dies. But when you're making disciples, you're rich in heaven. The mission makes us rich for eternity. Number four, shift our thinking from security uh, to service. Service. And number five, shift our thinking from comfort to sacrifice. Sacrifice may sound scary to you. A sacrifice is an offering. It just means we offer ourselves. When God brings opportunity, we offer ourselves over and over. The goal of this message is that I commit the rest of my life to being a messenger of God's good news to other people, using my time, talents, and treasures for his kingdom, regardless of where it leads or what it costs. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 9, we make it our goal to please him. Our goal is to measure up to God's plan for our lives. In the hospital, I found a new mission. I saw people coming in, and because of my blood thinning, sometimes they had to take draw blood every hour all through the night. And so they'd walk in, and your first response is, oh. And I could see on their face and I started thinking, what would it be like to have a job when every time you walk in the room, people go, oh. And so I started a new mission. And I said, God, I'm going to be the best patient ever. And so I had a mission statement. And I said it over and over. My son even memorized it. I would say, thank you for what you're doing, your work. You are making a difference. You are on the front lines. Stay safe. And I had people say, I never heard that. You just made my day. They started sharing stories of watching people die over COVID, dying alone in, in the hospital rooms, and that was my mission, and it felt good. It's not because I'm so awesome. I'm on a mission. I met a guy, and I asked him, where are you from? Did, did you go to Butte College? He's an RN. He said, I'm from Mexico. My parents sacrificed to get me to move here. And he said, uh, and I lived with some people who were partiers at first, and I was partying, and I thought, this isn't right. And I moved to another place where I was healthier, and I saved money, and I was able to learn the language, and I went to Chico State, and I got my degree, and I'm an RN. I go, that is so awesome. And so the last day, he came to me, and he said, I can tell you have a lot of people in your life who love you. Because I was getting all these messages from you guys, my kids, my grand, all around, so many places. My phone's going off, people are showing up. And I didn't want anybody to visit me. So many of you, I'd like to come visit you. I, I just, you know, I'm laying in that gown. And anyway, uh, so, so he says, you have no idea how many people I see in these rooms alone. Very unhappy because they didn't love their family and they don't have the relationships like I see in your life. And I thought, man, because I'm on a mission from God. And God 
bless me over and over. It's so exciting to think about a life of purpose, brothers and sisters. When Jesus came in and the disciples were crying, Hosanna, the Pharisees were jealous. And he said, make them quiet down. And Jesus said, if they quiet down, the rocks will cry out because he's the God of all creation. And it hit me one day in my 20s. Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So my life doesn't make sense unless I follow him. If I follow him, I have a life of purpose. So I'm in. I'm a member. And I want to grow. I want to follow. I'm a disciple. And I want to use my shape and serve in ministry. And I'm on a mission from God. Just one more. Just one more. I dare you to live life on purpose. You will never find meaning outside the call of God. But you, you go to God, you will have a life that counts. Amen? Amen? I'm sorry to go so long. I'm out of practice. I'll get better next week. Let's pray together. Father, I get so fired up. It's always been a challenge when I talk about this subject. Because to me, it's the most important purpose there is because it changes eternity. And I pray for the people around us in our Jerusalem, in our Judea and Samaria, in our world, that we will be witnesses, that we'll be sold out and bonsai to just keep putting in word for you. Forgive me, God, when I forget and I'm self-focused, God. Use this, Lord, as your, as your, your testimonies on fire with the good news of Jesus. God, thank you for the people that have come here. We've got people here now that are part of the family that weren't here when we got here. And we give you praise and we honor you and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, let's stand and worship God. Thank you.
Awesome. Hey, uh, what do we got for next steps? Man camp is coming. Yeah. Yeah. There's a sign-up sheet in the back, yes. and there is a flyer in your bulletin. Okay? Yeah. Open your bulletin. You're going to find lots of stuff in there. So check that out. We got our growth groups going and the invitation for Easter. Yes, yes. So and, use that. Uh, on Easter, we'll start our new series. I'm going to try not to go as long next week, so please come back <laughs> and uh, in invite your friends, and we'll try to really bless them for being here and not embarrass you. Okay? <laughs> That's right. We also have a baptism next week. Woo! that we're excited about. So we'll have the tub over here. If there's anybody that hasn't been baptized and you believe in Jesus and are follower, you can join that mm -hmm. also. That'll be a part of our celebration on Easter. Is that it? That's right. And look up for Elizabeth's QR code at the end of yes, the service. Thank you. you can use your camera and if you need help, just find one of us. We'll Let's send to help. our Elizabeth on a mission. Yeah. Amen. All right. Now it's time to pray for our offering. Yeah. Let's pray. Father, it feels so fun to give, to, to be free, and thank you for blessing us with that. God, make us a force of hope on the ridge and beyond that brings you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. Hey, before we celebrate with our last song, what is our purpose? Relationships, Relationships that last forever. How do we do that? Love, love God, God, love, love people. people. So remember, every single day this week, in Christ, we always love have God, hope. hope. Thanks for being here. Even though I walk through the valley, of the shadow of death your perfect love is casting out fear and even when i'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life i won't turn back i know you joined us today.
We can't wait to see you till next week, and we want you to know that we love you. Yeah.